Praise the Lord, Bridgeway. This is the first of a four-week series. Every year we do a winter guest speaker series. I'm going to introduce you to our first guest speaker. When you see a drama like that, it reminds you that God is in the transformation business. He can change us from what we were to what we are to what we will become. And today's speaker has a story, a true story, where you will see transformation right in front of your face. I won't give you too much detail about him except to tell you he is a pastor, Dr. Richard Harris is. He's a professor, an author, a speaker, and a civil rights justice activist. Makes his home in Florida with his wife. He has two adult daughters. He's holding degrees in Christian ministry from Indiana Wesleyan University and Bethel College, a master's degree in communication from Spring Arbor University as well as a doctorate in adult higher education from Nova Southeastern University, has taught at Purdue University and currently at Southeastern University. More than this, he's written a book called One Nation Under Curse. It'll be available when we are out in the lobby after the service. One of the things that I like about this man is not only his ability to communicate, but his ability to put his money where his mouth is. We spent the last week together. I had him on the radio months ago, building a relationship. He's a friend of mine, and I wanted to share him with you. Now, in order to do that, I'm going to ask you if you'd be so kind out of respect, uh, so there's not a lot of distraction. If you can, just minimize your movement during the message so you can really be engaged unless you have to leave or have to let people in, ushers. But remember, this is my friend. And I'm so happy to have him here on the stage at Bridgeway Community Church. Would you give a warm welcome to Dr. Richard Harris? If you had been with me on a warm, humid, summer night in Indiana back in the 1970s. You would have seen two men put me into a car, blindfold me, willingly, and drive me to an undisclosed location. They got me out of the car, they took the blindfold off, they took me inside, and they marched me down the aisle to a makeshift altar There were about a hundred people in that building in a very dimly lit room. And they marched me down to this altar and I stood there and raised my right hand and I swore allegiance to the United States of America. I swore allegiance to uphold all the laws of the United States of America. I also swore allegiance to Jesus Christ and I swore allegiance to white supremacy there on that altar before me there was an American flag a confederate flag two crossed swords a couple of silver bowls a Bible open to Romans chapter 12 and a cross that was on fire After I got done with that four-page oath, I lowered my hand and I thought to myself, is that all there is? It wasn't so bad. But then, out of the corner of my eye, I saw a man approaching. He was wearing an all-black robe, and he was wearing a black mask, and he was ceremoniously coming forward with his hands held out, and across them he had about an 18-inch hunting knife. They took that knife and they started warming the blade in the flames of the cross. And I remember again in my head wondering, I wonder what they're going to do with that. I didn't have to wonder very long. 
Two men grabbed my right arm, they held it up, and that hot blade came down and sliced open my wrist. And blood started pouring out, and they, they put it in the, one of the bowls on the altar. And when they had gotten enough blood out of me, which, by the way, was a long time after I thought they had gotten enough blood out of me, they quickly bandaged it. My hand is shaking from the loss of blood. They shoved a quill pen into my, into my hand, and they shoved that four-page oath that I had just taken in front of me and ordered, sign. And I dipped that pen in the bowl, and I signed my name in my own blood. They quickly rolled the scroll up. They held it in the flames of the burning cross. And they let the ashes drop upon the altar. I was 16 years old. I had just joined the Ku Klux Klan. Well, that was intense, wasn't it? <laughs> 31 years as a senior pastor. 25 years as a university professor. Now an associate pastor at a historic, all-black, African-American church. How do you go from a racist to a gracist? How do you go from that to this? where I work with social justice groups and civil rights groups, and my personal motto is, if it is not justice for all, it is not justice at all. Yeah. How do you go from being messed up more than you'll ever know to becoming whole and living well? The next 20 minutes or so, I want to share my story. And I want to talk about how I went from that to where I am now. And maybe along the way, we'll let my long journey become your shortcut to better race relations. But we got to start before age 16. Let's go back to when I was in elementary school. You see, I was the scrawny, little, thin, sickly kid. I know it's hard to believe now. <laughs> I'm trying to make up for those years. I was the one that the bullies picked on. I was the one they took the lunch money away from on the playground. I was the one they called names. I was the one who grew up angry. And I vowed in elementary school, some way, someday, I didn't know how, I didn't know when, I will get even. Somehow, I will have power. Fast forward a couple of years, sixth grade. Something happened in between fifth grade and sixth grade in my school. You see, my school had been an all-white segregated school. And now in sixth grade, desegregation. Suddenly, there were African-American kids being bussed in from the other end of town. I had never spoken to an African-American child. But now, here they were, and I use that word intentionally, they, it was them and us. They were on our turf, my turf. They were in my school. And I looked at this group of kids, and I said, they're displaced. This, they're out of their element. They've never even been to this end of town. Maybe... This is a group that I can pick on. And I did. You see, I could get away with calling them racial slurs because the ratio of white to black was about nine to one. 
And so I did. And also, in middle school, I had to write term papers. I had to give speeches in English class. And so my topics started becoming the Ku Klux Klan, Adolf Hitler, Nazism, white supremacy, segregation. By the time I got my eighth grade yearbook, Someone inscribed on there, to Richard, Grand Dragon of the KKK, keep those, in word, in line. I had a reputation. But it wasn't just the kids that had heard me over those years. No, you see, there were a couple of teachers in that school who were secret KKK members. And they were watching, and they were listening and they liked what they were seeing. And so they were reporting back to Klan headquarters, hey, we need to watch this Richard Harris guy. He might be someone useful in the future. I didn't think anything about the Ku Klux Klan ever, after, ever meeting a Klansman. I mean, how do you go and meet a Klansman? You didn't exactly look him up in the yellow pages. Now, now, some of you younger people will need to ask some of the older people what that means. All right. I didn't think I would ever actually meet a Klansman. I didn't know that I would really want to meet a Klansman because I had done a lot of research on the Klan. They didn't sound like they were very friendly people to meet. So I didn't think too much about it. But the Klan thought a lot about me. By the time I was 16 ready to join the adult clan, they happened to come into my life. They had been watching me for years. At age 16, I joined the Ku Klux Klan. Well, I was a, I was a smart kid. I was bright. I was good in school. How can a smart kid like me join an organization like that, especially since I really did know all about the clan? They came to me and they said, if you join us, we'll be your family. You see, my mother had died when I was 14. My two older brothers, one was much older and he was a doctor and married, had a family and didn't live with us anymore. The other brother was away to college. My dad was trying to balance and juggle two different businesses, the one my mom ran, the one he ran. I hardly ever saw my father. I was coming home. I was a, a, an upper middle class latchkey kid who was coming home to an empty house. I didn't have very many friends. I had a lot of enemies. And the Ku Klux Klan knew that. And they came alongside and they said, you know what? You're a lot like us, Richard. We could be your family. We could be your mother and your father and your brothers and your sisters. If you joined us, we'll be one big happy family. And not only that, we'll take care of you. We'll protect you. You become one of us. Nobody will ever call you names again. No one will ever pick on you again. No one will ever bully you again. Well, they actually did get that part right. From the time I joined the Klan, no one messed with me after that. I would have joined the high school chess club if they would have shown a little interest in me, but they didn't. I would have joined the church youth group of the church I was a member of that was only two doors down from my house if they ever showed any interest in me whatsoever, but they didn't. The Ku Klux Klan did. I joined the Klan at age 16. They immediately started grooming me for leadership. By the time I was 18, I was the second youngest Grand Dragon in the United States Klan. I was Grand Dragon of Indiana. Indiana is the largest Klan state north of the Mason-Dixon line. In the 1970s, the Indiana Klan was the large, largest underground terrorist organization in the entire Midwest. 
and I was their leader. I had power. I had an army at my disposal. I had four armed bodyguards that protected me wherever I went. I was somebody, finally. But after a couple years of being dragon, and speaking, and holding rallies, and writing propaganda, and basically inciting them to, to do things, after a couple of years, I found myself crying myself to sleep at night, realizing I had ruined my life. There was no getting out, there was no going back, there was no changing. Then I got word that one of my four armed bodyguards had put a hit out on me. He was going to have me killed. He just wasn't going to protect me. I couldn't prove it, but I believed it. What am I going to do now? I need more security. I need better security. That's what. I called the Imperial Wizard. He is the head of the nation. Bill, this is uh, is Dick Haywood. I want a national office. Oh, hello, little Dicky. Good to hear from you. That's what the Imperial Wizard called me. I didn't like it. But you don't say no to the Imperial Wizard. I said, yeah, this is Little Dicky. You want a national office? Yes, I've done a great job as Grand Dragon. I've, 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 I've built up Indiana. I even started the kids' clan, and we recruited in the elementary schools. He said, yes, you've done a bang-up job there. I'm proud of you, Dicky. He said, but I'll tell you what, we, we do have one national officer coming available. It's the national chaplain of the Klan. It comes as a shock to a lot of people. The Ku Klux Klan believes that they are the true Christians. And every Klan meeting is started with prayer, scripture reading, maybe even a sermon. I said, I don't know anything about being a preacher. Well, it's all right, Dickie, because the guy we got in there now doesn't seem to know much about it either. He said, he said, you would be a great one. I'll tell you what. You start reading your Bible, putting some good sounding scripture verses in your speeches, start sounding religious, and I'll take care of the rest. I knew what I'll take care of the rest was. It was clan words for we'll go to the national chaplain and we will suggest that he stepped down from his position. But we'll give him an option. If he doesn't want to step down from his position, we will give him the option of telling us where he would like his body to be found. I knew what that meant. I said, you know, Bill, that sounds great. I'm going to do it. All right, Dickie, we'll get working on it. That night, I started reading my Bible. Now, I had to find one first. I had to brush it off. And, you know, I should, have started in the, I should have started in the book of Genesis. I mean, it makes sense, doesn't it? But now I understand the Holy Spirit was guiding me. The Holy Spirit was leading me. Because I did not know one book from the other. I started reading in the Gospel of John. I didn't know John from Zechariah. But I'm starting to read in the Gospel of John. Oh, I'm getting excited now because because I realized, whoa, these are the stories of Jesus. I found the stories of Jesus. This is perfect. I will just pull out some things Jesus said. I'll quote Jesus. How can you get any more religious than that? So I'm reading along. John 1, John 2, John 3. Okay, reading along here, looking for good sounding things. I get to John chapter 4. I knew what John chapter 4 was. It was one of the clan's favorite chapters to preach from. John chapter 4 is the story of the Samaritan woman at the well. And she meets Jesus. You see, the clan 
did teach me one thing correctly, and that was what a Samaritan was, half Jew, half Gentile. In other words, a half-breed, a race mixer. If there is anything the Ku Klux Klan hates, they hate race mixing. And so the Klan chaplain would, would read us uh, the story, and he would get down to the point where, of course, Jesus is asking the woman for a drink, and the woman was surprised, for Jews refused to have anything to do with Samaritans. She said to Jesus, you are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? That's the end of the Samaritan woman at the well story. We didn't exactly have our Bibles at clan meetings with us. So we assumed that was really the end. The chaplain would go on and say, we know what Samaritans are, race mixers. Yeah, if Jews don't have anything to do with race mixers, well, we're smarter than Jews, aren't we? Oh, yeah, we're smarter than Jews. I'd only met one Jew in my entire life up to that point. But I knew I was smarter than them because the Klan told me I was. Well, if Jews don't have anything to do with race mixers, then we don't have anything to do with race mixers. Jesus hates race mixers. That was the story of the Samaritan woman at the well. Jesus hates race mixers. Now, though, I'm reading it for the first time myself. And I discovered there was more to the story than that. I read through, I, I saw how this woman became a believer in Jesus, and Jesus accepted her. She goes back into the town, she brings a whole bunch more race mixers out, and they become believers, and Jesus accepts them. <laughs> I wasn't stupid, I could read. Jesus loved race mixers. That was the real story, Amen. and the light bulb went on. The Klan has been lying to me. The Klan's not the real Christians. I stayed awake that entire night. I read the entire Gospel of John. And I kept finding place after place after place where the Klan had twisted scriptures, had just blatantly lied about the scriptures. They were wrong about the scriptures. I was reading the Bible myself. When I got done with the Gospel of John, I didn't really know how to pray, but I, I prayed something like this, God, if there is any way that you can get me out of this alive, I want to find out what a real Christian is, and I want to be one. I quit the Klan the next day. Now, it's kind of a long story. We don't have time for the whole thing here. But sum it up, they put a gun to my head and they said, we're going to let you out, but you're going to keep your mouth shut. I kept my mouth shut for about 15 years. And then circumstances happened and some people found out who I was and pretty soon... The Associated Press had written a story about me, and I was in all the newspapers. I spoke to this one group, and the Associated Press put in all the newspapers the next day all around the country, X Ku Klux Klan Grand Dragon speaks out against racism and the Klan. Boy, <laughs> that'll change your life really quick. <laughs> so I was out, so I might as well start doing what I knew God wanted me to do anyway. And I started speaking out against racism and the Klan and white supremacy. And I became, I was a professor, I was a pastor, and I, I, I treated people with respect. I had black colleagues, I had black students, and I treated them well. Gone were the racial slurs. 
gone with any kind of mistreatment. And I thought, I'm doing all right. But then I started having a family. And I realized at that point, my racism came through my family line. I was taught it at home. Oh, they never said anything directly. But even, even our nursery rhymes had racial slurs in them. I picked it up from my parents. They had no black friends, no Hispanic friends. No one of color had ever come into our house, nor would they be welcome in our house. And I wondered, are my kids going to end up the same way? I started searching the scriptures. I kept back. I kept coming back to John chapter 4. And John chapter 4, let me give you three words that, that, that meant something to me. That set a pattern for me. The first word is resolve. John chapter 4, verse 3 and 4. Jesus left Judea and returned to Galilee. He had to go through Samaria on the way. Now Judea's down here. Galilee's up here. Samaria's right in the middle. So of course you would just go straight through Samaria. No, you wouldn't. If you were Jewish, you would go around. Because you didn't want to go through Samaria. He had to go through Samaria. Well, no, he didn't really have to. There were other routes. Why did he have to go through Samaria? He had to go through Samaria to model racial relations for his disciples. He had to teach them how to interact with people who were different from them. He resolved to do it. I made a resolve. I, I resolved. I made a, re a resolution. I resolved that I was going to intentionally be a different model for my children. And so the resolve was the first word. And then the second word is respect. Soon a Samaritan woman came to draw water and Jesus said to her, please give me a drink. He was all alone at the time. His disciples had gone on into the village to buy some food. The woman was surprised for Jews refused to have anything to do with Samaritans. Respect. First of all, she was a Samaritan. That's the Jew's enemy. Second of all, she was a woman in a man's culture. And third, she had been married several times and was living with a man who wasn't even her husband. But Jesus showed her respect by speaking to her in public. The disciples would have just shunned someone like that. But Jesus wanted them to see we communicate with each other. We respect each other. The last word is relate. Relate. John chapter 4. Many Samaritans from the village believed in Jesus because the woman had said, he told me everything I ever did. And when they came out to see him, they begged Jesus to stay in their village, so he stayed for two days. Jesus stayed with them for two days and related to them. Do you have any idea the powerful message it sends to others when you invite people of other races into your home. Out to eat with you. On vacation with you. To the movies with you. Do you realize what that models before your children? Do you also realize what it models before your friends and your family if you don't do that. You don't have to say a word. People are watching. And they're getting the message. You have to intend to befriend. When I started doing that, I purposely made friends, real friends, with people of other races because I wanted my children to see how to properly interact 
with people who might be different from you. That it was normal for black people to be found shooting pool with me in my billiards room. It was normal for us to take a vacation with an African-American family or a Hispanic family. That was normal. That is the new normal. That's what I wanted them to see and have modeled for them. I broke the curse of racism in my family. And was it God who did it? Of course it was God who did it. But we have to cooperate with God. I moved from racist to gracist. And believe me, when I say, if God can do it for me, the former grand dragon of the KKK, God can surely do it for you. Thank you. Dr. Harris, thank you so very much for your courage, for your openness, for your vulnerability. A couple of questions, okay. uh, pressing in just a little bit, moving from being the Grand Dragon of the KKK for Indiana to now being an associate pastor at a historically black church that was built by freed slaves, submitting yourself to a senior pastor who's African American. No one can do that but God. Yeah, yes, 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 absolutely. This week we had this Congressional Gracism Forum, and then we had the National Prayer Breakfast, and then we had a private tour of the new National uh, African American Museum of History and Culture. Anybody been there yet to the museum? It's pretty powerful, and as they were walking us through, I was with uh, Dr. Barbara Williams Skinner, who also goes to our church, a civil rights leader, a, a supporter and sympathizer of the Black Panthers way back when. And here we are together. Just imagine her uh, and, and Dr. Harris together. And I imagine, hmm, what is it going to be like when we get to the place where the KKK regalia is? And uh, we took a picture right there with uh, uh, Dr. Harris uh, and I together. And uh, this was regalia that he was used to. In fact, he still has some uh, that he keeps. You have uh, robes and things of that sort. Why'd you keep it? Well, I kept it early on because I didn't know what to do with them. Right. Yeah. And so they were just tucked away in a closet in a bag, obviously. And later on, my wife even suggested, hey, you want me to make their satin? You want me to make some satin pillowcases out of those? And <laughs> I said, no, no, I don't know what to do with them, but I don't know, I, I don't do that. Well, then after I started speaking out, I realized that if I was speaking locally, I would take some of the clan robes, it kind of added a realism, you know, to everything. I was speaking to a group of all African American men. I was doing their men's retreat for their church. And so I had brought, it was local, so I had brought my robes and I just held them up and I talked a little bit about them, explained the symbolism behind it and uh, went on with my, with my uh, talk. Afterwards, they were asking questions, I was signing books and, and uh, one of the older gentlemen said, would you mind if I touched your robe? And I said, well, I'm not, I don't care, go ahead, doesn't matter to me. And I didn't pay too much attention to it. The next thing I did, I looked over. There were five. They were, they were older African-American gentlemen. And they were, they, 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 were, they were touching. They were feeling the satin. And they were just looking at every little bit of it. And tears were coming down their face. And I was thinking, oh, I shouldn't have brought them. Now I've offended them. And oh, I should not have brought these robes. I was stupid. And so I went up and I, I apologized. I said, I said I, I'm so sorry if this has offended you. I, I can put these away. And 
no, 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 you don't understand, Dr. Harris. We have lived in fear of these robes all of our lives. And now we feel like we have power over them. And that fear is gone. And they're nothing but satin to us. Thank you for bringing them. There are several people here today that always knew the KKK existed. And there's others who thought it was something that was in the past. Um, there are some for the first time. They're riveted uh, because of the experience today. Um, let's bring it up to today. What kind of people did you have in the Klan that were normal, everyday people? And is the Klan still alive today? Okay. The Klan is a secret organization. We need to keep that in mind. So people aren't usually going to go around telling you, guess what, I'm in the Klan. There were doctors, lawyers, police officers, firefighters, teachers, professors. I can go on and on. Business owners, pastors. Pretty much every walk of life you can think of, they were in the Klan. Now they might, during the day, they would show you respect if they saw you on the street and you were uh, of a minority uh, race, they would show you respect. Those same people would be at a Klan meeting that night. Is it still going on today? Absolutely. The Klan actually has grown in the last eight years. Something that a lot of people don't understand is there's no law in this land that says that you can only be a member of one hate group at a time. So when we hear numbers about the neo-Nazis or the Aryan skinheads or the white militia and we hear these numbers, almost every one of those people have got a Klan robe hanging in their closet. They're members of both groups. And the Klan has just grown and mushroomed over the last eight years. So yes, they're still around, they're still active, and they are still dangerous. So it's not Donald Trump's fault? No. No, I, 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 was, I was speaking uh, to my congregation, mostly African Americans. I was speaking to my congregation just a few weeks ago. And I told them, I know a lot of you are afraid and you're scared and you're, you're very anxious about what's happening in our country. But listen, Donald Trump did not cause the racism in this country. Neither did President Obama. That racism has been there a long, long time. Just simmering under the surface. And l lately, the events have caused it to bubble up. I said, but I don't think that we need to be afraid for two reasons. Number one, our God is greater than that. And number two, because it has come to the surface... People are actually talking about it because we have gone for decades with the majority of white Americans saying there is no race problem. There's no problem at all. That was settled with the civil rights movement and all the legislature and the desegregation. That, no, there's no problem at all. Now you don't have to convince people, yes, we do have a race problem in this country. That gives me hope because if we are willing to admit we have a problem, then we can start to work to talk about it and solve it. This is the time for bridge builders to stand up and to help build bridges. Uh, just one more uh, before we uh, close in prayer. There was a time when the KKK was violent, and maybe they still are, uh, but there's been a shift in the in the way they work. Yes. Would you share? All right. When I was 
part of the Klan. It was in the 70s. It was right after the very violent 60s and the, and the whole civil rights uh, movement and all, where the Klan was extremely and overtly violent. Now, they were still violent when I was with them. I mean, they, they would still take a gun and, and, and blow your head off in an instant. But they had learned some lessons. They had learned that, number one, jail is not a fun place. So they did everything they could to keep their leaders out of jail and keep them from getting arrested, which meant they developed some new tactics. Yes, they still used violence, but now they added some new tactics. I remember my mentor in the Klan would preach to me and say, why break a man's legs? You'll go to jail for that. Why break a man's legs and he'll heal when you can destroy his marriage and it will ruin him for the rest of his life? Yeah. And that was some, and that was some of the... Uh, well, thank you. And that was some of, the, some of the tactics. So we would literally have people come in, go in and they would volunteer to commit adultery with, with one of our targets. And then we would call the spouse up on the phone. They would get caught. It would destroy their, destroy their life. Also, fear and intimidation. They used a lot more fear and intimidation because you really don't go to jail from causing people to be afraid. So they got smarter, much smarter. And they're even smarter now than they were then. If you're going to give a word to our white people who are here, uh, many white people are bridge builders like you, but many are still wondering what to do. How do I take in this information? If you could just give a word to help them. Uh, and then our minority community, whether blacks or Hispanics or Asians, how do you help them uh, deal with this as well? I'm hopeful that now there are more white people who actually realize there is a problem and we need to do something about it because I spent many, many years trying to convince people there was a problem, which I knew there was. White privilege is a thing. It's real. But those who are experiencing white privilege and benefiting from it, they don't really see it. What's there to see? It's just life, the way it works. When you come alongside and have friends of minorities, then you begin to see how, yes, people are treated differently in this country. So my challenge for white people is to wake up and open your eyes. Build some friendships. Build those relationships and start paying attention to what's really happening. And then use your privilege to speak up for those who do not have the privilege. And likewise, for people of color, you too have got to build bridges. It's not just the whites who need to be inviting, inviting and making new friendships, but rather it's you too. Reach out, reach out, but don't lose hope. Because our God is a great God. He's still on the throne. Amen. Pastor Angel Cartagena, please come up. How do we say thank you to Dr. Richard Harris? Thank you so very much. What courage, what calling, what humility. May God protect you and keep you. Um, Ricky Bolden, come up here very quickly, sir. Come on, Reverend Ricky. Let's put the white man in the middle. Make an Oreo cookie right here. There you go. We're going to throw some peanut butter on top of it. Okay. All right. Um, take his microphone. Do you have one? Yeah, give him that one. As a black man in your era, how do you respond to this? Yeah. What's going on inside your heart as you hear this? And then I'm going to have you say a short prayer over, over yeah, Dr. Yeah. Harris. Well, you know, I have studied, uh, I, many of you don't know this, but 
I collect black memorabilia, and one of the things I was interested in early was the Ku Klux Klan. And so I have a real nice collection of things from the Ku Klux Klan. And in fact, I was going to tell you, if, uh, if you put uh, your uniforms up, I bid it one day $500 for a Ku Klux Klan uniform and lost it. And so they are very valuable. The Ku Klux Klan, they are real. But, you know, I think that what he said is just so important. Uh, what my collection has really motivated me to do is to build more relationships intentionally. Whether I go to work every day and I see a white brother or a white sister, I'm intentional about building relationships. Whether it be me in church and seeing a white brother and a white sister, I am intentional about building relationships. And so as I hear this, the only way we are going to really build the bridge is through relationships. That's what this church is all about. That is what this church was founded on. You know, the reality is, is look at the pastor and his wife. No, that, that's the truth. Ain't she They're, fine? Oh, look my goodness. Ain't she fine? She is a beautiful woman. Come on. But even before the church was started, there was a bridge being built. And I just want to encourage you, the only way I believe the Holy Spirit is going to get rid of this ill is that we build bridges. Come on, pray, Because pray the reality is, is that the reason why we can hate someone is because we don't know them. And that's how God built bridges of love. Amen. Thank Come on, you preacher. so much. We yeah. need you to pray over this man. Yes. He's going to be our Father's Day speaker, by the way. If yes, you have heard yes. him speak before, Amen. he'll rock the place out. Thank you so Amen. much. Ricky Bolden. Go ahead Amen. and pray for Father, thank Dr. you so Harris. much for Dr. Harris. Father, we thank you for his story. We thank you for his testimony. Because while others might look at this as, man, how could he get involved in something like that? Father, you had a much larger plan for his life. You knew what he would be doing 10, 15, 20, and 30 years later. You knew that he would be a build bridge builder. You knew that he would be leading people like never before to you in a very fresh way. And Father, we thank you for your word. Yes, Lord. Word that brought freedom. A word like the Samaritan woman. Mm. Father, who can bring so much freedom. But we, Father, we, we pray that just as Jesus built this wonderful relationship with this woman, it was unusual. And Father, not only was Samaria made whole, not only were all of the brothers that came out later made whole, Father, we just pray that you continue to use us today, that others may be made whole, yes, Lord. that we be instruments and vessels of your love and of your grace, that when people see us, they can literally feel and, and they, can, they can feel the hands of Jesus touching them. They can hear the voice of Jesus like never before. And so, Father, we ask you, to protect our brother. Please, Lord. Father, we pray that you give him strength to continue to carry the banner. Yes. Father, we pray that your Holy Spirit will give him a strong voice to continue to speak up and to speak out against the ill of racism. But more importantly, Father, we pray that you protect him. Bless his family. Bless his going ins and his comings out. We love you and we praise you, Jesus, for it is in your matchless and mighty name I pray to you be glory. Amen. Amen. We're heading out to the book table. We'll see you in just a minute. Can we praise God this morning?